the session is sponsored by Impact and Anderson, which uh, delivers impact through technology, healthcare innovation, climate and sustainability initiatives. Uh, that, uh, the, the goals of impact are well evidenced by today's fireside chat, uh, the topic of which is the future of food, uh, with our distinguished guest, Seth Goldman, in conversation with Impact at Anderson's interim faculty director, Jennifer Walski. Before we begin, I'd like to thank some of our co-sponsors uh, today, uh, including the Price Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, the Morrison Center for Marketing and Data Analytics, the SAM Initiative, uh, an LA-based uh, nonprofit. I'd also like to thank uh, uh, student clubs at Anderson who are supporting this event, including uh, Net Impact, the Entrepreneurs Association, the Retail Business Association, and the Marketing Association. The current crisis has made us all think more about food and the food supply. Many people around the globe, as well as here in Los Angeles, do not have reliable access to healthy, affordable, or sufficient food. This food insecurity issue was a problem before the current crisis, but has really been exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, this crisis, though, also gives us an opportunity to think about uh, the future of our uh, of, uh, food supply and uh, to be thoughtful and reflective about both how we consume and produce our food. And that leads to many interesting questions uh, which will be uh, looked at today, considered today. For example, given climate change, what are the best practices for uh, food consumption and production? At what cost to the planet do we satisfy our food preferences? And how do we think about innovation around lab-based food? And is that the answer to these uh, problems? So to discuss these questions and many more, uh, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Jennifer Walski, who will introduce our distinguished guest, Seth Goldman. Jennifer. Thank you so much, Tony. So before we get started, I want to just thank the SAM Initiative. The SAM Initiative has been a wonderful partner across UCLA Anderson and specifically at Impact. The SAM Initiative is a women's giving circle committed to driving social change through collaborative giving. They address immediate needs in the community and in today's food crisis, they utilize their network and resources to provide food to our most vulnerable neighbors. And then I also would like to now introduce Seth Goldman. So Seth Goldman is a founder of Eat the Change. It's been a pleasure. Seth and I have been on many panels over the years as part of Net Impact. Uh, Seth was very early involved with Net Impact when it was, I think, first starting uh, out of yeah. Yale uh, and has continued to be on the board and then a large supporter. In fact, I don't think you've ever missed a Net Impact conference. Is that right? Uh, uh, yes, I'm the Lou Gehrig of the Net Impact world. <laughs> I guess uh, I'm happy virtual this year. We'll see what happens by fall. Uh, <laughs> That's a good so point, yeah. So Seth and I have been on many panels together over the years, and uh, it's always been a, a pleasure to have Seth uh, in the room and now in our Zoom room. Uh, just a brief introduction on Seth in case you're not familiar with his illustrious career path so far. He's been the founder of Eat the Change, a platform to inform and empower consumers to make dietary choices aligned with their concerns around climate and health, and he has co-founded that with his wife, Julie Farkas. Seth is also a co-founder of Honest Tea, uh, that's how we know Seth coming out of Yale. I've had the pleasure of teaching that case many times. It's my favorite, uh, my favorite drink of my daughter. And he's chair of the board of Beyond Meat, located right here in El Segundo. He's also recently launched uh, one of the few restaurants launched during COVID-19, uh, Plant Burger, which launched within Whole Foods, uh, where my nephew lives in Silver Spring, Maryland. And, uh, and he's been widely recognized for his entrepreneurial success and impact, including Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year, in Greater Washington, the Washington DC Business Hall of Fame, Beverage Industry Magazine's Executive of the Year, Beverage World's number one disruptor, and a partnership for Healthier America's CEO of the Year. So I think you're very credible to be with us today to talk about the future of food uh, through all these different convenings. So I wanted to start with just a, a, a sort of, you know, one of the things we're talking about is the future of food looking out and, and future of impact was a theme derived by our wonderful gold rated net impact chapter as we looked at some of the virtual talks we want to do throughout the spring. But in particular, looking at this unique period of time we're in, you know, uh, in, in a worldwide pandemic, I think we've all started to think about, we've all had to think about food differently. And, you know, given the, the topic of our fireside chat, um, it's brought to fore some of the real issues around access and immediacy, as well as preference. You know, we can't get the things we want. Toilet paper, let alone, but mm -hmm. milk, eggs, a variety of things have been difficult to locate. And in managing our produce and our pantries, you know, we've had to think about food differently. You've really looked at founding this foundation to think about food 
with Eat the Change. How, if, how, if you don't mind me getting just a little bit personal for a moment, how have you and your family, I know you have older kids as well with you, how, how has this brought to home what's happening with COVID and how we really need to think about food? And yeah. given it's Earth Week, how we need to think about the resiliency of our planet? Well, first, I just want to say what a pleasure it is to, to be here with you, Jennifer, and, and with this uh, gathering. I, you know, we tried to do this last year, and um, the Beyond Meat IPO, uh, I couldn't tell you exactly why I was away, but I said, I, I, you'll understand in a few weeks, and that took me away. So I'm glad that we're able to make this happen, and it's an important discussion, and especially important now. And um, I think by definition, any entrepreneur, you know, is um, driven to be optimistic. So I'd like to take an optimistic look at what's happening now. Obviously, it's a tragic um, pandemic happening and uh, with lives being lost. But if we can think about what could be a good outcome here, I think that it is um, helping people reexamine the choices they make. Uh, it's helping them think about the connectedness of the world, the fact that uh, what we do or what someone does on the other side of the planet can have a, a, a huge impact on us. And so every choice we make, every food choice we make does have an impact and, and getting people to be more thoughtful about it, I think can be a, a positive thing. I, I think also um, facts really uh, matter. Um, I think we're learning you know, through this health crisis that you know, opinions are, it's, it's, everyone's entitled to an opinion, but we're not, we shouldn't be defining policy or living our lives by opinions. We should be relying on facts. And so as we look at the facts around uh, our diets and climate change, they're real and, and are, they, they can't be ignored. And I, and I hope they won't be ignored any going further. I think another interesting thing to answer your question is, I, I, I hope this can help people become more um, flexible with the way they think about their diets. You know, if we were having this conversation 20 years ago, and you said, well, you can only meet, the only way to get calcium in your body is to drink milk. The only way to get protein in your body is to eat animal-based uh, eat, eat animal protein. Um, that was the mindset then. I think today it's a much more expansive view. And so, um, you know, our family certainly hasn't been able to, to find everything we want on the shelf, including Beyond Meat. Occasionally it's sold out. Yeah. But we've been, we've been fine uh, in terms of meeting our, our protein needs. And my wife and I have three sons. They're all... In their 20s, they're all athletes, and nobody is wasting away. You know, uh, tonight we're having a, a chickpea uh, dinner. You know, there's going to be plenty of protein in that. Uh, last night it was uh, Beyond Meat um, pasta and, and with sausage. And so, um, you know, uh, when you can be more expansive the way you think about where your um, nutrients come from, you can have a, a well-nourished meal and, frankly, even a cost-effective meal as well. So, um, it, that's a, that's an entrepreneur's way to say this could be an opportunity to help people shift towards both more sustainable, healthier, and even more affordable diets. So I think you, when you and I uh, spoke last week, you were saying you opened one of the few restaurants during COVID-19. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we know, I, I'd like to dial back in this, you know, at some point to, you know, co-founding of Honest Tea and some of your initiatives around that, as well as yeah. your role as chair of, uh, of Beyond Meat. But tell us about Plant Burger and what it was like to yeah. open it during the middle of this pandemic as well, and sort of what kind of has given you a glimmer of hope through all this. Yeah, so this actually goes back. There was a panel I did almost three years ago now um, at George Washington University with a, a chef named Spike Mendelson. And like I do, uh, whenever I'm with a potential customer, I brought along a cooler bag for, of honest tea and some Beyond Burgers for him to try. And he took the, he loved the tea uh, and he actually said, boy, I'd love to have both of these in my restaurants. In fact, what I'd like to do is, you know, would you be interested in launching a restaurant, a plant-based restaurant where, you know, featuring Beyond Meat. And at the time I was um, working for Honest Tea and Beyond Meat. So there were issues around bandwidth as well as conflict of interest. But um, we got this restaurant, my, my son and my wife got involved uh, in last year, launched the first of uh, what's called Plant Burger and it's PLNT Burger. And so you could read it as Plant Burger, but you could also read it as Planet Burger or Plenty Burger. Uh, and the, uh, the first one was located inside of a Whole Foods in Silver Spring. And just last week, we opened the newest one. I, I, I came on earlier this year as a co-founder of the chain, and we launched uh, a new one in Washington, D.C. And so um, there's a few reasons why uh, this restaurant is able to launch um, when others obviously are having huge challenges. One is that we're located inside of Whole Foods. And Whole Foods, you know, deemed essential work and still has traffic. And the people who are managing Whole Foods, at the very least, want to make sure their employees have food that they can um, eat, you know, because they, they close down all the hot bars, all the, all the prepared food sections. Um, but the other th piece that's happening, of course, with Whole Foods is 
a lot of people are increasingly looking towards plant-based diets. And so to have um, the ability to both get food from a, a grocery store as well as to, um, you know, groceries, but also uh, hot prepared food. Uh, and then of course, having a chef who is really creative and fun um, has been a, a really um, neat experience. And, and I, one other insight that um, I think is helping drive success for Plant Burger is a recognition. Uh, and this is, you know, I think every industry by definition has to be re-examining itself right now. And certainly the restaurant, the food service industry, as we know it, will not be the same um, or as we knew it because it's, it's, it's basically decimated right now. And when it comes back, it's not going to be what it was. And so the traditional model of, you know, a, a restaurateur renting, uh, taking on a lease, a three-year or five-year lease, doing a build-out, which can cost a million dollars or right. more, um, just is that's not a business model that's going to work. And we're fortunate. I can't, I'm, I will never claim I was a visionary to see that um, that this was going to happen, but you know, for Plant Burger, we've managed to avoid that model for these restaurants, and I think that is going to be one of our competitive advantages. Well, I think it's brilliant because people can try if if they haven't experimented with this yet. You know, they can go get a burger and then they can right. walk over to the other aisle, and they can take it home with them that day and make it at home. So, yeah. and um, coming from Los Angeles. When I first moved here, one of the things people said is, you know, we're really, McDonald's was founded here. Hamburgers are really our thing. And, and, mm. and it's the whole testing of what, are the, what is the best burger. And I know that Bob Nassindavon, our executive director of Impact, and I had the opportunity to go to your test lab and test kitchen in El Segundo mm. and I'm gonna test it. It's an absolutely delicious um, Thank you. alternative burger. Uh, but tell us a little bit about what was the catalyst for getting involved with Beyond Meat. I remember you saying you and your wife just really missed the taste. If, of all the foods you missed when you became vegan, you really miss the taste of, of a great hamburger. What was sort yeah. of your catalyst there? Yeah, so I um, launched Honesty 22 years ago and I've always been connected to food and the planet and health and thinking about that. Um, and um, it was in, um, so I have, as I said, three sons. Back when our uh, oldest son was a, uh, about 10 years old, he decided to become uh, vegetarian. And he, what happened was we took him to an animal sanctuary in, in yeah. Maryland. And after the, uh, while we were there, you know, we had this fun, in particular, this one rooster who was really had a lot of charisma, a charismatic rooster would, was following us around and was kind of a little bit ordering us, you know, where to go. And uh, his name was George. And, and uh, he really made an impact on us. And that night we actually went home and totally um, coincidentally had chicken for dinner. And our son Jonas said, boy, what, what's the difference between George and, you know, this yeah. thing on our plate? And we didn't have a good answer. And that started a series of questions that he kept asking, which was, you know, if we can meet our nutritional needs and our dietary needs uh, without killing animals, why wouldn't we try to do that? And so we became vegetarian uh, as a family when Jonah became 13. He's 27 now. Um, and over time, um, we were happy with the decision from an ethical perspective. But we were often frustrated from a culinary perspective. We, we you know, especially about burgers, we just always felt dissatisfied and disappointed with those. Um, and so in 2012, my, re my wife read an article about this company getting started out in California, Beyond Meat, that was looking to launch in retail. And so I sent an email to info at beyondmeat.com and said, boy, this sounds like a really powerful idea. I'd love to help. And um, I uh, was at a place where, you know, honesty, we had, we had sold to Coca-Cola, we were still growing, but I wanted to take on a new challenge. And, and uh, Beyond Meat welcomed my help and I became an advisor and then board member and then chair of the board. And um, it, it had been a lot of fun to, to grow. It's still a lot of fun to grow that business. And it's been such a, a, a powerful moment because <clears throat> the people's tastes are changing. The science that Beyond Meat has based their product on is, is really game changing because it's, it's, it's a step change away from all of the other plant-based burgers that we'd had in the past. They just, it had the juiciness, the texture, and, and you know, as a result, we got it carried in the meat section of grocery stores. We got it put on menus of major chains, uh, not just as like, here's our healthy veggie option. Here is part of the, the, the core menu. Well, I know that Carl's Jr. is now, um, you know, yeah. carrying the product throughout. And, and even though Impossible Burger is a competitor, it's kind of validating for the space that they're in White Castle and a variety of, of areas, too. And just mm -hmm. so students get an idea, this is taken from an article of New Yorker that, quote unquote, cooked beef contains at least 4,000 different molecules, of which 100, 100 contribute to its aroma, flavor, and two dozen contribute to its appearance and texture when you heat plant parts, they get softer or they wilt. When you heat a burger, its amino acids react with simple sugars and unsaturated fats to form 
flavor compound. So that, that kind of gives people perspective on how science-based and how, oh, yeah. uh, what, what an effort it's been to sort of take this journey of what you guys have done. And, um, and just to build on that, one of the key things that we've done at Beyond Meat is, um, you know, the assumption, as I mentioned in the past, was when you ask people what is meat, they'll say, well, it's protein from an animal. And right. at Beyond Meat, what we've said is, well, meat is really just an assembly of amino acids that form the proteins, lipids that form the fats. And when you frame it that way, you actually get a very different result in terms of how to address it. Because if you insist that meat is from an animal, then you'll never uh, come up with a substitute. But when you can um, change the, the framing, then you are able to look at different op options like Beyond Meat. So we're talking about a, a plant-based diet, and Stephen Chu is a former Secretary of Energy also, and gives frequent talks on climate change, has been quoted as saying that if you think about beef, it, it's greater than all of the EU, and um, or it has the same impact of eating a burger as flying from New York to London, and the average American eats that much every month. Uh, so to give you some perspective, this has huge uh, impact. Yeah. So, um, if, if cows were a country of their own emissions, let me quote this properly, yeah. it would be greater than all of the EU and uh, only behind China and America as far as its contribution to global warming. Every four pounds of beef you eat contributes to as much global warming as flying from New York to London, and the average American eats that much every single month. So that kind of gives you the impact of, of, of sort of the alternative plant-based diet. But one of the questions we sort of get in this is there have been some food startups that are doing kind of lab-based food, right? Yeah. And so I think a lot of people look at this and say, well, you know, there's been a lot of research that shows uh, some lab-based food can, can have as much uh, environmental impact as a chicken. Chicken has the least environmental impact. And so is cell-based food uh, a potential option for this as well? Or, or what's kind of your view on this? Yeah. So first, just to build a little bit on um, your quote from Stephen Chu, because it's not just about CO2 footprint, but it's also water consumption. Yep. And uh, beyond, we did a life cycle analysis at Beyond Meat uh, with working with the University of Michigan, a peer-reviewed analysis that showed we use 99% less water and 93% less land compared to a beef burger. And th th so it's, it's a dramatic difference. It's not, oh, we're 10% better, or <laughs> it's a right. dramatic difference. Um, and lab-based is another approach. And I look, at this point, I think every approach is worth exploring. And, and um, ultimately, I think the consumers will define what really succeeds. I can say that um, companies and efforts like what Beyond Meat are doing are being re very well received. And so um, I, I think that there's a lot of science behind what we're doing at Beyond Meat as well in terms of um, trying to figure out how to make these products efficiently and taste delicious. Um, I uh, do worry a bit about how consumers will receive lab-based, even just the name itself or that, that framing is, is challenging. I think consumers also should ask what are the health differences because if, if we have health concerns around the cholesterol or the fat associated with, with animal-based meat, then does lab-based avoid that? And I think the last thing to look at is just time frame. Um, so far, we have not yet seen lab-based grow to a place where it can be scalable from a cost perspective or, or a volume perspective. And so that's still work to be done. Uh, and I guess, you know, um, I feel good about where Beyond Meat is. We are, we're, we're building a a movement with consumers and with customers uh, that, as I said, is being well received. So um, th those folks at the, in the lab based movement will have to start uh, doing that at some point. The other thing I want to hit on as we look at, you know, people on planet, given that this is Earth Week, is preference. And we've sort of kind of grown as consumers to love, love our preferences, which has all been challenged during COVID-19. So, you know, some of these, you and I've talked about this too, having, you know, strawberries 12 months out of the year or having our favorite kind of strawberries 12 months out of the year. And I just want to also quote another researcher from the University of Manchester who recently found that asparagus eating in the, eaten in the UK has the highest carbon footprint compared to any other vegetable eaten, eaten in the country because of the fact that it's flown in and imported from Peru. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you don't mind, just at, at given this larger stage, thinking a little bit about... And you and I've had this conversation about tea. So founding honest tea, yeah. you, know, you said yeah. tea should, there are some things in the supply chain, global supply chain should remain domiciled in those regions that mm -hmm. they grow those products best. And you've had to think about this as well, right? Because sure. one of the conversations you and I've had is um, honest teas involved with organic and fair trade. And I'd like to still get circle back to that later. But what we don't really have on the labels of our food is what the carbon footprint is. And yep. this even came up in another climate change talk we also had with the former CEO of Walmex is, 
you know, if, if something takes a huge transportation cost or Postmates or Grubhub or whatever to bring what you want at that moment when you want it, consumers sort of are unaware of what that cost factor is right now. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I certainly applaud any effort to try to lighten the environmental footprint of, of what consumers eat. And we always, at, at Eat the Change, that's one of our you know, underpinning principles, eat with intention. And, and so to the extent you can think, be thoughtful about it, that's important. But um, it's also relevant to look at what is the percentage of, of freight or of shipping relative to the overall cost. And when you look at, and this, this came through in the life cycle analysis we did with Beyond Meat, we looked at the freight because we do, um, at the time that life cycle analysis was done with Beyond Meat, we were shipping in peas from France. We, we now sell, we now buy most of, or at least half of our peas from the United States. Um, but even when we were shipping from France, even with that freight factored in, our freight as a um, energy consumption was a half of a percent of the total energy consumed to produce a beef patty. So it, it's, it's really not as significant. And so what I've said before, and, and you know, you, someone might say, oh, it's good to buy locally produced meat, you know, that, that'll save, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, and uh, but a locally produced hamburger um, is still not just percentages higher energy consumption than a plant-based burger, it's multiple. You know, as I said, it's, it's, it's multiple times more energy consumed. So I, the first thing I would say is make the choices that are, um, have a lighter footprint to start with. So organic, uh, in terms of the energy consumption or the CO2 footprint, plant-based, um, and but stressing biodiversity, thinking about lighter weight packaging, avoiding food waste. Those are the key first steps. And then after that, it's certainly relevant to look at freight. Um, and I, I'm a I am a believer in eating seasonally, um, yeah. but I, it's, it's just, um, it's a, they're really apples and oranges, so to speak, in terms of the way we think about their impact. And I, I think you were citing Martin Heller uh, earlier when you were talking about Beyond Meat Statistics. He's a sustainability researcher who led University of Michigan study. But his, his kind of epitaph on that is, you know, try to avoid heated greenhouse grown fruit and veg vegetables when you can and stuff that may have been air freighted. Um, but he obviously gives a strong recommendation for plant-based diet and, and why that still makes a lot of sense given the alternatives. Um, so we talked about, we we're talking about people and plant a little bit, but I want to go more to the people side because one yeah. of the things you and I also share, I used to be on the board of Fair Trade USA. You've been a huge supporter of Fair Trade certification. And when I teach some of these concepts in my classes, I always find that people sort of understand organic. Yeah. People can sort of understand buying local, right? They, they have, you know, food markets and farmers markets and things right now. But fair trade is sort of one of those esoteric terms that sometimes people don't understand what that means. Can you share with us, with your work at Honesty, why was fair trade certification so important to you? And, and what, sure. did, what did you, I, you did a lot to move that forward as far as all of your ingredients. And I don't think people understand how complex that is when you're looking at these supply chain issues. Sure, sure. Yeah, so Honesty was the first to make uh, organic certified bottled tea. Uh, and that was important to us because of the environmental impact. We wanted to avoid all the chemical pesticides um, going into the ecosystem, but also to the workers. And then as we dug deeper, we realized tea was one of the world's cheapest commodities. It's, it's produced by some of the poorest countries in the world. It's in, consumed by some of the wealthiest as well as some of the poorest. So um, we realized that we could buy some of the highest quality tea in the world, and we were still only paying a few pennies per um, bottle. And so then we said, well, look, if we're only paying, spending, you know, and by the way, what we spent on tea literally was 10 times what a lot of other companies were spending on tea. So if it costs us two cents a bottle, they were spending a fraction of a penny. Uh, but we said, well, look, if we spend two and a half cents per bottle, but that gives us a reassurance that we are um, helping to invest back into the communities that supply us, that we can make sure they're paid a living wage deemed by, you know, in their culture that they also have a portion of the sales they can reinvest back into their community, then we should do that. And so in 2003, we were the first to launch a fair trade certified bottle tea. But we asked at the time, could we make everything fair trade certified? And, and we realized we couldn't because there wasn't enough supply uh, and, it, and it wasn't, um, um, the pricing wasn't competitive enough. So we worked with our suppliers to convert more gardens to become fair trade certified, to grow the supply chain. And by 2011, we converted everything to fair trade tea. And then by 2015, we converted all of our sugar as well to fair trade certified. And we've also launched, Honest Tea has launched now 
um, the first uh, fair trade certified products that Coca-Cola is distributing in Europe. But one other interesting aspect of fair trade isn't just that it helps support, um, you know, a, a social justice, a um, quality of life for the, for the workers, but it's also an environmental imperative. And what I mean by that, if, if you look at Project Drawdown at drawdown.org that lists the 80 solutions for global uh, cooling the planet, uh, their top, one of their top 10 solutions is educating women and girls. And so you say, well, why is that an environmental solution? Well, it turns out that when you can educate women and girls, they all, they'll have, um, they stay in school longer, they have fewer children and they have them later in life, which leads to population control. And when there's fewer um, footprints on the earth, then it's an environmental, you know, the positive to just have less, um, less footprints. So um, for us, fair trade is, has many layers of, of why it's important and, and um, it's another pillar of Eat the Change as well. So I'm going to start taking some questions uh, from the audience, if that's okay sure. with you. Sure. And, sure. and just so everyone's aware, I, I know it was posted in the chat box, but we are using Slido. Uh, so please make sure that you post your questions there. Um, the first question I have that, that is it's got a lot of support from the audience is from Pranav Yoshi. And so one of the things that we talk about is, is you know, the plant-based burger planet-based burger, however we want to interpret that, um, being in Whole Foods. But what is your sense of how we are on this journey of plant-based foods? And by the yeah. way, I just want to mix into that question a little bit, that there is some controversy with some plant-based foods because some almond milk and some of the nut-based alternatives can actually consume a, a disproportionate amount of water, some people think, compared to yeah. other alternatives. So tell us a little bit about your views on that. Sure. So first of all, we're very early in it. And that's what's so exciting about it. This is just getting started. And to give you a sense of it, plant-based meat is, well, it's growing, but it's still less than 1% of all meat consumed in the United States. If you look at it in terms of dairy, um, plant-based dairy is about 13%, which is obviously more and growing, whereas animal-based dairy is shrinking. But I looked at some recent data from Whole Foods uh, toward the end of last year, and over 51% of the sales in Whole Foods was um, plant-based dairy. So it's a really, this is going to, I'm confident, continue to be an area of growth. Um, and so what's really exciting, as you start to think about the implications here, let's, let's think 10 years out. And, and, and it's early in terms of the product development cycle, too, because Beyond Meat really just launched the Beyond Burger in 2016. So we're less than five years in. But if we think five or 10 years out, and we end up with a product that is, a, from a taste perspective, is at parity or better, from a nutritional perspective, is it at parity or better? From an environmental perspective, is, as I said, like, you know, miles ahead. Um, then the question becomes to the consumer, why wouldn't you have plant-based protein? Um, I don't believe humans have an innate need to kill animals. I mean, it's, it's a yeah. byproduct, but I don't feel someone's going to say, I really want to kill an animal to meet my dietary needs. And not to, the last, to me, the deal breaker is, and if plant-based protein becomes cheaper, if it is less expensive than animal-based protein, which we're, we're confident it will be because we're using so, so many fewer inputs, so much less energy, so much less land, then it really becomes a game changer. And, and so we're really, what, what I am confident in is, is your students, the students here, will think about a time, will look back at talking to their children or their grandchildren and they'll say, did you really live at a time when People, you know, killed and slaughtered billions of animals to meet their yeah. dietary needs. Didn't anybody sort of see there was something odd about that? And that will be a, a really remarkable transformation. So from an evolutionary perspective, um, we will be the first generation that disconnects the term meat from animals. Yeah. And, and that's exciting. To answer your question around um, environmental impacts, yes, it's true. Uh, almonds are a relatively resource water intensive crop. But I go back to that contrast, it is still apples and oranges. And you can, there's, you, you can say that um, almonds are more water intensive than another nut. But uh, from a water footprint, uh, and I, we haven't done, I, the, I haven't done the life cycle analysis that we did at Beyond Meat, but it's still, you're not talking, it's, it's, it's still multiple differences when you look at the uh, water footprint of dairy milk. Because you've got to feed, the, you've got to water the crops and you've got to water the cows. Uh, yeah. So it's just, a, it's, it, it, it is still apples and oranges comparison. Great. One of the things uh, that's also been brought up by Daphna and a lot of students have support for this question, and it's one of the questions we had discussed too last week, is accessibility. So certainly yeah. COVID-19 has brought to fore 
Um, also food insecurity issues that a lot of people are experiencing, but let's be real, that happens 365 days of the year in many parts of this sure. world. Um, and then when we look at some of these plant-based alternatives now, you know, you and I talked about the fact that uh, Beyond Meat, um, meat you know, meat product is, is about twice the cost right now of, of hamburger. Now, mm -hmm. I think it's important for us in talking about this question to get into kind of some of the brokenness around how we, you know, process meat right now, yeah. which leads to that low cost. And I, I'd love to circle back to that. But how do you think about accessibility and, and where we are in this movement? Because if it stays in the, you know, if it stays in only the Whole Foods and doesn't get to the Ralphs and the Safeways yeah. and, and other things, that, that might be problematic for our community. Sure. No, it's something that's very much on, on, on our minds. So first of all, um, the, we are, as I said, in the very early stages of this technology and like any early technology, whether it's cell phones or even cars, they start high expense and then as you scale them, they, they become lower. Uh, one of the things we're proud of with uh, Beyond Meat is that We've already been able to bring up the, launch the product in certain markets at, at a cost um, competitive price point. So we launched nationally with Dunkin' Donuts, uh, with Dunkin', I guess it's called now, and they have a Beyond Breakfast sausage patty, which is the same price point as their pork sausage patty. So from our point of view, that's a great place to be. Um, uh, one of the things we're excited about at Plant Burger, the restaurant, is that our, our main uh, burger is at six ninety five. Um, so that's a competitive price point, and we launched it in. Um, Silver Spring, Maryland, which is a very urban community. It's by no means uh, like a Manhattan Beach analog. So, you know, uh, we wanted to be able to make this product available to all types of um, uh, communities and all types of demographics. And, and actually notable that Plant Burger, that over 20% of the receipts are cash-based, even now, which is, you know, unusual because people are obviously trying to move away from cash um, interactions. But um, so, so uh, this is absolutely a key part of what we're trying to do. And, and certainly at Eat the Change, one of the goals, I, I didn't talk about what Eat the Change is, but it's in addition to becoming a, a for-profit company, Eat the Change is a nonprofit platform where we are making donations to nonprofits that are helping um, promote planet-friendly diets across all parts of the community. And so we're, talk, we're already funding some um, activists and, and advocates for bringing plant-based diets to more communities. So one of the things I think is important in this also is talking about, about health. You know, when we talk about the people sure. side, we talked about a living wage and, and maybe not even a living wage and no fair trade USA's bar is two meals a day. You know, that's how they measure if they're fairly paying people for the work that they're doing. But let's talk about the health side of this and looking at a plant-based alternative. And I think it's really important too, because as we've seen in the recent news, you know, Tyson shut down a couple of plants mm -hmm. because of virus spread. But even before that, uh, you know, there's some issues with the use of antibiotics, the overcrowding of farm animals, yeah. the processing plants. And, you know, we've had many recalls happening across different food sectors. Sure. I just want to say, because I'm pretty close to the co-founders of Earthbound Farms, who also did the largest, you know, salad production around the world. They've had E. coli issues. So any, any large food production can have issues. I just want to have a lot of fairness to that. Yeah. But I mean, some of the issues we're having uh, with our overcrowding of farm animals and our processing plants is, is, is getting to the point now where, you know, even non-COVID, there's some, there's some key issues that are concerned from, from yeah. just mom buying for my, my family. What are, what, are your, what are your thoughts on this from just a health perspective? Well, obviously, um, I'm biased. <laughs> I'll yeah. get to that. But, uh, um, and, and we have to be careful because there are, you know, uh, from an FDA perspective, we can't go out and make claims that this is healthier. But what we can say, there's no, you know, products grown without cholesterol, uh, mean that the um, plant-based meats, um, usually they'll have less fat. Certainly Beyond Meat has less, dramatically less fat than you'd find in an animal-based product. Um, but then the other pieces you're talking about, the, the antibiotics and the yeah. hormones, these other things. Antibiotics to me is actually a, a really important concern because one of the things, you know, when people used to worry about and now we're seeing is when you see these animal-borne diseases and not, not that this one can be treated by antibiotics, but imagine a germ spreading and that people's resi antibiotic resistance has been numbed or dulled because the, the cows are taking antibiotics and so when you ingest those cows or the, those animals, um, you know, you're developing a, basically a, a, your own tolerance of antibiotics as well. And so um, these are real, these, these, um, the whole animal-based food system, I think um, we're starting to see um, some externalities created by it. Not, we, frankly, we've been seeing them from a, for a long time, if you look at it from a climate perspective, as you outlined, but 
we're starting to see some other externalities that are um, helping trigger more awareness and certainly more re-examination of, of what those, um, of that diet and, and its impact on our health and on the planet. So this question comes from Liz, and this is something we also talked about. Uh, and actually, and I'm so glad you, you asked this and other students supported this question because as we've talked about Honesty, this has come, come up for a while. And that's the fact that, uh, you know, Honesty was ultimately sold to Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the earlier questions from students are, where, where are we in this mainstreaming of plant-based diets or mainstreaming of, you know, yeah. trade certified? And um, I know you donate a lot of the proceeds of that back in to, to build a business personally, but tell us a little bit about the, the good and bad of this. Um, sure. Yeah. So, so uh, when I launched on ST, there was never a goal to uh, just have a quaint little um, business that I could feel good about and pat myself on the shoulder and say, aren't I doing nice things? It was to make change happen. And in my point of view, the way change happens is when you bring it to scale. And so um, I grew it for 20, it was with it 22 years. And what I'm excited about as I look at where the business is, it's been brought to scale without compromise. And what I mean by that is when I launched, actually not, we only had some organic ingredients. Today, everything Honest Tea sells is organic. As I said, we started in 2003 with Fair Trade. Today, everything Honest Tea sells under the tea brand is, or is Fair Trade. We don't, some of the kids' drinks are, aren't um, Fair Trade because it's just not Fair Trade juice, but, but they are still organic. Everything Honest Tea sells is lower calorie relative to uh, its category um, across, you know, and that's true across the world. And so now the business, when we first um, took in an investment from Coca-Cola in 2008, we were at about uh, 20 million in sales. And, and last year at the end of the year, we were um, 13 times larger than that. So, you know, um, we had grown dramatically and actually from a retail perspective, almost half a billion in sales. So uh, from my point of view, the, the outcome which, we, which I had hoped for, which is to democratize organic, to democratize and expand the access to uh, healthier, more sustainable products has happened. And in fact, our Honest Kids drinks are carried in McDonald's, Wendy's, Chick-fil-A, Subway. So not just in the coast, not just in Whole Foods, but really available and accessible to a wide audience. And of course, the, as a result of that scaling, then the impact on these communities becomes genuine. We see more communities going in India or China or, or Paraguay, uh, where we buy our sugar, you know, uh, adopting organic standards and practices, more of them adopting fair trade. So those are real. Um, and I, I don't have any regrets about that. You know, I'd say the downside of um, selling to a larger company is you get to be less nimble. Um, so you don't get to be as um, creative and, and maybe as fast moving and dynamic. Uh, and so for me, that you know, that's, I recognize that. And that's why I've um, launched, you know, both got involved with Beyond Meat, but also launching this new brand as well. So, and, you know, I guess the question is, would I have done it? Uh, would I do it again with the way we did with Coca-Cola? And the answer is absolutely yes. Well, and we talked about this too, because when, when Ben and Jerry's, the ice cream, uh, usually when we talk about this case, I like to ask what people's favorite flavor is. <laughs> Mine is Chunky Monkey. But, uh, but when you look at Ben and Jerry's and they're bought by Unilever, one of the things that came up is, you know, did they did they sell out, right? Because yeah, it's a yeah. very socially progressive, and that led to a lot of the benefit corporation. Um, but you know, the thing that you and I have spoken about too is that to validate this as being real, you need scale. Yeah. Which and Coca Cola has bar on the best dis distribution mm -hmm. of a new beverage company, right? And so you kind of have to hold these things and in context to look at the continuum. And the the recent one, the reason I'm leading up to this is you know, Beyond Meat, and yes, you did miss a, a conference last year for very good reason, and that was Beyond Meat's IPO, initial public offering. And you mentioned to me that's one of the most successful or food offerings in the last 10 years, one of the few food offerings last 10 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. How was that important? And how is that important in validating what we're looking yeah. at for plant-based diets? And just to go back earlier, you know, I think what's validate, important to validate with Honest Tea is um, the guardrails. So uh, the, the key with Honest Tea, one reason I'm confident it will continue to um, maintain its its most important um, impact is because the the guardrails of the brand are third party verified standards. So organic, we can't just or they can't. It's not me anymore, but they can't just say, oh, we're earth friendly or earth conscious. It's it's a USDA certified and enforced standard uh, for what organic is. Same with fair trade. I, beyond me, uh, honesty can't just go out and say, oh, we're you know socially conscious. They have to um, have a paper trail 
and inspection documents to prove that every ingredient meets a third party, third party verified inspection and standard. So that's what's important with um, protecting honesty. I think with Beyond Meat, you know, just the product itself, the, the fact that it's plant-based, the, the impact there is, I'd say, more direct and more clear. And so as Beyond Meat was growing, we did have to think about, well, what is our right strategy? How do we continue to evolve? And so one option is, do we go raise more money? One option is, do we sell to a strategic partner or do we, um, you know, an IPO is just another way to raise money. Um, we decided it didn't make sense to sell to a strategic partner for two reasons. One, no strategic partner, which would most likely be some kind of a meat or food company, was going to take the research as seriously as we do, uh, meaning they weren't going to dedicate as much resource, as much energy, and as much focus on continuous improvement. And, you know, big food companies have, they have bigger budgets than we do for R&D, but they're not focused. We are, Beyond Meat is exclusively focused on making meat from plants. Uh, and so what we found with the IPO is, um, as a, a way to raise money, it tremendous, it, attracted tremendous attention and it really elevated awareness of, of the business and of the brand. And, and um, so what we've seen as, as in response has just been, we, 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 we like to think we were creating a global brand, but it, 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 it accelerated that process. And just this week we announced that um, Beyond Meat is being sold in Starbucks across China. And so that's an example of the kind of global impact might not have been available to us had we um, stayed as a, a smaller private company. So I, a lot of the students on this call are students and um, some are graduating this year, some may be graduating the year after this one. This is yeah. certainly a tumultuous time to be looking at graduating, especially if you're in traditional hiring segments. I did actually look at Beyond Meat site and notice they had several jobs up there. So just take Good. a I know from Seth info at Beyond Meat or maybe just apply <laughs> if they've gotten bigger to the web to those jobs on the website. The is website now, yeah. Um, and it just shows that there's still growth in food segments that are that are going to be growing innately yeah. no matter what. Uh, but students have questions if they're going to move into the food business or even look at, at having their own startup in this climate right now graduating. What kind of advice would you give them? Because we know you founded this with your professor out of Yale, probably on a, on a shoestring budget when you first sure, started. Yeah. So maybe yeah. you could tell us a little bit about that yeah. then and now. Well, here's a few thoughts, big macro thoughts, just about um, crisis in general. So I, I, I taught in China just after I graduated from college, and I'm <clears throat> still friendly with one of my uh, with many students, but one of whom I just was trading an email with, and I, I wanted to make sure I understood it or remembered it correctly. But the Chinese character for crisis is composed of two elements. One element is danger and one is opportunity. And obviously there's real danger in this crisis. There's health, there's economic risk, uh, but there is opportunity. And then the key is how do you find the opportunity? So um, the opportunity comes when you can recognize a transition that's happening and be part of it. And, 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 and if you think it's gonna accelerate. So even in this conversation today, what are some of the transitions we've talked with? Well, one is obviously the shift from animal-based protein, whether it's dairy or meat, to plant-based. Another transition I referenced was this transition away from the traditional restaurant model. Um, I don't see that model of, um, you know, food service outlets paying large annual rents for, uh, every, every month, regardless of what happens to the business. So um, thinking about what would be a business model that capped or, or, you know, connects to that kind of opportunity. So Yes, there are definitely opportunities out there, but it is, it's, it's, it's a scarier time. It's going to be, I don't want to say it's harder to raise money because there are still investors out there looking to invest in this space, but it's going to be hard to raise money for a Me Too business. And, and frankly, that's, that's a good thing. I don't, I'm not a believer in a Me Too business. And I, I'd like to, I, I believe that, you know, any of these businesses I've been part of were disruptively different. Um, so the key then is how different can you make it? And, and when I say disruptive, yes, it has to be very different from what's out there, but it also has to be better. And, and I'd say in better, in not just taste and experience, but in impact. We have to think about where is the world going and where do we want it to go? And how do we create products that connect to that as well? Since you're so closely tied to the food industry over all these years, um, you know, are there food incubators? Are there mentorship areas? I mean, uh, you know, some of the conferences that normally exist aren't happening. Of course, right now, maybe they'll right. go virtual. But where should, what kind of resources yeah. students seek that are interested in the, in the food space? There are. There are lots of great spaces. So a few things going on. One is um, my friend Gary Hirschberg, who's the CEO of Stonyfield Farm, is hosting something called the Hirschberg Entrepreneurial Institute. 
and uh, they have a, a weekly um, chat. It's called uh, Tales from the Trenches, and and uh, um, I did one just two weeks ago with him. You can go online and, and listen to those. He also has a, a boot camp, um, which I think is going to be open to people um, or a small fee, um, where there where there's going to be pitch sessions, uh, and so. Those are even, it obviously used to be in person, now it'll be online, but that's a great way to learn. Um, the Expo West, which normally, which is taking place in March, was canceled this year, but it's in Anaheim, and, and those, are, those trade shows are amazing gatherings of natural foods companies and a great way to learn about what's happening. Net Impact, of course, is a great network of, of, of students uh, and employers who are in the food space, and as, as you mentioned, I've been to every conference <laughs> since the, the very first one. Um, and um, there are other incubators and accelerators. Um, some are food focused, but in my view, they don't need to be food focused for them to be helpful and relevant. Um, you know, I was not part of any food incubator. I wasn't part of any incubator, but that was a different era. But I think having mentors, having other peers to connect with and network with are useful. And uh, I don't think people should only be talking to themselves or the only talking to the food industry. The, 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 the skills, the disciplines, the learnings, uh, the experiences of an entrepreneur really, I believe, go across sector. So a question from uh, one of our MBAs graduating year 21, uh, G. Kang, is on what are some of the potential setbacks that might slow the adoption of plant-based products? She said, me, he or she said me, but I think we're, we can yeah. run it out for products in general. Well, certainly taste is the key driver. So uh, when they taste great, that makes it easier to adopt. And, and uh, that's one reason why you know, Beyond Meat, the partnership with Carl's Jr. has been so great. The product tastes great. And when people taste it and they say, oh, that, that tastes really good, uh, that makes it more appealing. Um, there are some efforts by the meat industry to try to slow the spread of these products. They are um, trying to constrain labeling options. And so those kind of things could have a, a chilling effect. But my point of view is the consumer wants this, is con consumer is seeking it out. And when you have the consumer on your side, um, that's the right partner. So I much I had a choice between you know highly paid lobbyists or consumers. Over the long term, I want the consumer on my side. So I'm um, confident this will continue to grow. Um, look, there could be uh, you know I, I hope it doesn't happen, but there could be a negative story about a health impact or or um, as as you mentioned, Jennifer E. coli or some. I mean, there could be some negative health story that scares just like that's a that's a risk endemic to any food business um but uh i i believe that the more we gain and that's why i go back to my, what i said earlier about facts the more that people have an understanding of the environmental impact of their dietary choices uh, the more this is a direction that will continue to grow well it's it's interesting as you guys gain more market power um i i, I like to tell my students you know when the benefit corporation was being proposed as a you know, double bottom line, social good, as well as um, financial good organization state of California, the biggest people that opposed it were the nonprofits, which really surprised the lawyers that wrote that. Are there, are you getting pushback from some of the meat industry lobbyist trade organizations or maybe not yet? Sure. Oh yeah, no, that, that's what I said, the legislation that they're um, out there proposing is trying to um, restrict the use of the terms meat, the use of the word sausage and you know, um, just as they did with dairy, they tried to oppose the use of the term milk. But you know, if you can have a if you can have a salmon uh, sausage, a turkey sausage, you sure should be able to have a plant-based sausage. That's my opinion. So, question coming from uh, Brian Sokolow, who's one of our student leaders graduating this year, and I've had the pleasure to work closely with Brian as part of our Anderson Venture Impact Partners, is around. It, how, how can consumers easily understand when they're at the store? I mean, now we're going into the store, gloved and masked, you know, it's, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's an expedition, right, yeah. Uh, yeah. for us. But even in normal times, we're running into the store. If we run to the store, we're ordering online through, through Instacart quickly because we're trying to obviously often fill our pantries. We, you know, maybe it's even for food that night. How, how do we help consumers understand how they should buy clearly. And I guess that's why I was getting yep. to this carbon label, but I've seen this confusion around, you know, fair trade in my work with them. How many labels can you put in a banana? Like organic, fair trade, you know, yeah, yeah. uh, non-GMO. I mean, you know, some right. of the labels I choose sometimes are like, well, was that ever, was that ever, you know, like, or what was the one? It was a briefcase made out of Naga hide and they said it's a vegan briefcase. And I'm like, really? But it's, I don't know if that's good for the planet just because it's plastic. But you know what I mean? There's a lot of confusion yeah. around labeling now. So yeah. 
What do you think? What do you think consumers should well, do? Well, the first thing is to make sure that labeling is clean, clear, and and transparent, right? Um, so, you know, for us, we always were insistent it has to say plant-based right on the front, and obviously even just the name Beyond Meat so suggests that. We also encourage retailers to do to create real distinct sections. So, as I said, Beyond Meat is in the meat section, but it should be in the plant-based meat section as opposed to you know, um, uh, sort of scattered throughout. Yeah. Um, but then I think it's incumbent on the companies to make sure the consumer has that understanding. And so that, that communication work probably happens outside of the store. Uh, and so that's one thing we're working on. And, and, you know, as I said, with Eat the Change, we're going to do everything we can to help consumers make those informed decisions. And a lot of that informing doesn't happen at the store level. It's got to happen beforehand. Well, I noticed with Beyond Meat, they have a lot of celebrity ambassadors and other ambassadors who are like, you know, I'm an athlete and this is my diet. And yeah. so, you know, to try to overcome some of those issues that or perceptions people might have. of a For sure. It's really important because the, the excuse or the, the, the deal breaker that often happens is, uh, and I know this in a family, you know, where there's athletes, someone will say, well, I need, you know, I need animal based meat to perform. And it's so to have some of the best athletes in the world be able to say that, uh, and these are folks who, you know, they, there's no way they would compromise their performance just uh, if, if, if they thought animal-based meat would make them perform better. Um, so yeah, it has been a really helpful to have the uh, ambassadors at Beyond Meat. So since Brian posed that question, it also maybe uh, circle back to this thought around funding. Um, you know, right now, we're not sure what kind of capital crunch we have in the venture community as they look to kind of support and source um, really support their ongoing investments, which often happens in a downturn. Right. We've seen some communication already going out to venture capital firms, to their portfolio companies. So if you're doing a startup, you know, we talked about being scrappy. Yep. But are there, are more venture firms now that you've had the success of Beyond Me and otherwise, you know, do you think there's more interest in funding these type of food ventures? Oh, and for are sure. there angel interest? Or yeah. sharing opportunities or other opportunities. That, no, that there's have. definitely interest out there. But I, I, I would always, I always encourage entrepreneurs who are starting out not to think about venture money. Start with angel money because it keeps you more disciplined. It keeps you more focused. Uh, and you know, you have to prove the concept. You should never be seeking venture money unless you've demonstrated that you have something that is scalable and has proven itself. And so that's uh, why angel money makes more sense. And so angel money is you know, maybe it's a little harder to find right now just because you know, people are sort of thinking twice before they write a check. But um, I, I think that's a useful way um, to, to keep someone focused. And, and uh, we wrote a book, um, my co-founder Barry and I called Mission in a Bottle, which told the story of how we started on tea. And we were very, very, we only started in 17 Whole Foods stores, uh, but those stores were everything to us. We had to succeed there because if we didn't succeed there, we wouldn't, be able to sell anywhere else and so we raised money from angels we we made sure to succeed in those stores and once we did that was our launch fed but um i think the the mistake would be for someone to say well if i can't launch nationally i'm not going to do this or if i can't raise the money to to do a full launch it's like well start somewhere and that you can do you know tomorrow if even if it's starting at well <laughs> farmer's market may be a little tougher right now but i mean find a small scale way to to test your idea and uh, and once you prove that you'll be able to start raising more money. Um, it's, it's, money's out there. It's just, you've got to um, think about how to, what you need to do to be able to um, deserve it. Well, the financial discipline allows you to, like you said, prove your value proposition before you right. expand right. too quickly. And right. certainly if you, if you can't get venture money, you're going to preserve equity in the short term, term too. So whether you want to or not, you're, you're yeah. definitely going to preserve equity. Um, as we sort of get to wrapping things up here, and I've been kind of monitoring the questions, so I would just encourage you, I, I might have time for one more quick external question if you guys post it quickly. I've been monitoring the, the Slido. But, you know, as we, as we look at this, this interesting, interesting time we're in right now, the fact that we're in the middle of Earth Week, all these things that are going on, you know, we're, the title of this is The Future of Food. Where do you hope we are 20, 50 years ago? You already alluded to this earlier. And what are some of the real tangible, you know, things? If we look at, I like to say to my students, you build a staircase one stair at a time. But right. what is, what's that first step that we can take um, to, to sort of yeah. ensure that trajectory of a more sustainable food consumption? 
There's a few. And, and a lot of these are at eatthechange.org, which is the, the website we've created. So the first one is we have to change the mindset of people so that they are eating with intention. We have to help people recognize that every time they eat, it's a choice. Now, it, most of the time they don't think about it, but can you eat with intention every time you eat? It doesn't mean everything has to be grown your, on your, by yourself and you know, you're sort of, um, you know every farmer, but like, can you bring a intentionality to the way, not just obviously with food, but the way you live, but certainly with food is a great place to start. Um, can you, in, in order to eat with intention, uh, you need facts, right? You can't just say, oh, well, this was grown, you know, 20 miles away and, um, you know, or grown on the other side of the country, but it's plant-based, but here's an animal that was slaughtered 10 miles away, that's better. Like that, those are, if you know the facts, then you'll know that the, the plant-based option is still more sustainable than the, the locally sourced in this case. So can we make sure that facts are, are a part of the decision-making matrix for people? Um, and then can we, uh, it, when we have those two things in place, when people have intention and the information to be able to make intentional decisions, that becomes a very, very powerful um, change. And so as I look ahead, I, I, I'm confident plant-based will continue to grow. Um, I, I, I'm hopeful organic will continue to grow. I, I, it hasn't grown as, as quickly as plant-based, but it does feel like the right direction. I think another thing that's really interesting is thinking about biodiversity, thinking about the, a range of ingredients, a range of foods, and that's, that can be better for your health. You know, from a protein perspective, you'll get more nutrients. Uh, your body will ingest them more when you, when you diversify the inputs, um, but it's also better for the planet when we can support more uh, crops, um, more different types of crops because it helps anything that's a, a biodiverse uh, landscape is more resilient than a monoculture. So how do we make sure we're not relying on just the same crops for, you know, 80% of our diet? I know that the, in terms of the, when you look at what's planted around the globe over, you know, there's basically five crops that are responsible for more than 60% of all farmed crops. But can we think about um, expanding the diversity of crops, which is going to be better for all biodiversity? Um, not just plants. So I think this is a great note to leave our talk today on is eating with intentionality. And one of the TED Talks I encourage you all to look at is um, by a, a New York columnist named um, Mark, Ritt, I think it's Bitterman, who talked about he, his challenge is just until 6 p.m. every every night, he's he's vegetarian, you know, maybe mm -hmm. not even vegan, vegetarian. Uh, and, and just how transformative that was for him, and I would say for me as well, to, to think about how much um, meat consumption we're doing, that if you just try to even knock out one meal or two meals a day sure. to have them free of meat, it, it's, it, you will find, all of us will find how challenging that is in our society today, but also how transformative that can be when we start uh, embedding those practices into our daily lives. And what a better time to do this when we're, we're home quarantining and really being thoughtful with our friends and family on, on what we do on a daily basis. So with that, I just want to say thank you. I know we have a closing slide we're going to put up to thank our sponsor, again, the SAM Initiative. I want to thank all my partners here at UCLA Anderson uh, that have also helped us co-sponsor this event, and additionally, all of our student groups who are about this as well. And most of all, Seth, I'll see you across the Zoom room, uh, <laughs> or hopefully in person at a, at a Net Impact conference. Yes, I hope so. If, Thanks if so much. Able to be at, back together again. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you.